There are some things in life that you can't do without people. Like, eating challenge. Surprise birthday. Trust fall. And when we go through life, we do it with people. Because just like these things, there are just some things you shouldn't do alone. Well, welcome to Grace, everybody. It's good to see you guys this weekend. And uh, welcome everybody watching online and at Montrose and our live sites. It's good to, uh, to be joined by you guys as well. Thanks for taking the time to do that. Uh, before I get into our conversation this weekend, um, if you are familiar with All In, All Out, uh, then you realize that I didn't talk about the sports ministry in that video update, and that was on purpose. So if you're, if you're our guest, All In, All Out was a, is, a, is a vision campaign that involved the, the Opioid Recovery Center, interns and residents, and then our sports ministry. And uh, in our sports ministry, um, that would be a, a big, big deal to us. So uh, there's over 500 kids involved just in basketball, as an example, uh, in, in our sports ministry, and hundreds of adults and others involved as well. And we really want to grow that area of ministry. About 50% of those children that are tied in uh, are, do not attend a church anywhere. And so our sports is some basketball and then a bunch of discipleship and lots and lots of relationships. So in the all-in, all-out effort, uh, we knew that in order to expand that ministry, uh, we were going to need to build a, a building to make that happen, to build an athletic complex. And so that's a big part of all-in, all-out. So I want to update everybody on that, uh, that process. It's going well. We've hired an architect. We're uh, working with a builder. And we're getting ready to make some uh, kind of final decisions to press go on that. And before we do that, we want to meet together as a church family. So those decisions are kind of too much to process on a, in a weekend setting like this. And so we want to have some, a couple of meetings about it. So here are the meetings. If you got your phones out, write these things down. There's two options for you. One is Saturday, November 16th. Saturday, November 16th uh, at 8.15. So uh, if you're unfamiliar, we have Saturday services. There's lots of parking. The tithe is one, it's only 9% there. And Jesus will love you more if you come to church on Saturdays. So all that's in the Bible somewhere. But, but uh, that's one meeting. So after those services, 8.15, that meeting will have child care. That meeting will have child care. Your other option is Sunday, November 17th, from 6 to 7 p.m. That is during student life groups and during power outlets. So Sunday, November 17th, that option will not have child care, okay? So Saturday, child care. Sunday will not have child care. And we'll meet together for about an hour, and I'll walk you through our thinking and walk you through the progress, and then... Uh, kind of we'll move together as a, as a church family. All exciting stuff, all positive stuff, uh, but stuff that we need to talk about, okay? So that's the sports ministry update right now, um, the, the facility update, and we'll meet together and can't wait to bring you up to speed on that, right? So lots of exciting stuff always happening at Grace. It's a blast to be a part of things here. We're going to have an exciting week this week. Uh, family Fall Fest today is going to be a blast, so hope that you make it out for that. And uh, the collective concert on uh, Thursday is going to be phenomenal, so make it out to that. And then there's, there's always a ton of stuff we want you to be a part of it, okay? All right, we're, um, we're in the middle of a series, actually not in the middle, I just started it last weekend, but we're in a series right now called There's Some Things You Should Never Do Alone. And in this series, we're talking about relationships and how God created us, that God created human beings to interact with each other. And when we isolate, uh, when we isolate physically, emotionally, especially spiritually, 
that's always going to harm us, right? That's never going to help us. In fact, that would be a punishment, right? If you were put in solitary confinement, that's a punishment for someone. It's always going to hurt us. It's always going to break us down because we weren't created to exist away from each other. And especially spiritually and especially the church, the Christ followers, God would say, you guys need to gather uh, together. Don't give up the habit of gathering together like some are in the habit of doing. The scripture talked about that. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And then you need to share your lives. You, you need to love people and allow yourself to be loved. You need to know people and allow yourself to be known. And that's part of how God works in our lives in big ways. And so we started talking about this last weekend. And we said, if we're going to do that, if we're going to uh, if we're going to love one another, bear with one another, celebrate with one another, do these one another things, uh, how do we start doing that? Like, where does that conversation even begin? Well, it begins with a directive from Jesus. And so we looked at this last weekend, John 13. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another <clears throat> by this Everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So this command is directed specifically at Christ followers. And God says, Jesus says, listen, my followers, I want you to be, I want the hallmark of you following me, I want you to be known by your love for each other. Not your politics, not your cultural positions, not even the fact that you would come to church. But I want, I want people, when they look at you, and they see you loving each other as I have loved you, I want that to be the aha, they must be Christ followers. Look at the way that they love each other. And then when you press that idea through the rest of the, the second part of the Bible, the New Testament part of the Bible, uh, you see that it gets expanded, that Jesus would say, I want you to love each other, I want you to love your neighbor, I even want you to love your enemies. But God's people should be known for the fact that they are willing to love in the manner that they have been loved. So that became the question then. Well, what is that manner? If Jesus is our example, if we're to love each other as he loved us, well, how did he love us then? What does that look like and how does that play out in our life? And we went to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 where he explains some of God's heart and mind on this issue. And he says this, he says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Because when we say, I want to I, I love as Christ loved me, well, love has a bunch of definitions for us, right, in our culture. And it's not that they're, they're all wrong, it's just maybe different than what God is talking about in different places. So there's a love that I would have for a friend, there's love that I might have for a family, there's a romantic love, there's all those kind of things. Paul defines what Jesus is saying kind of clearly, and he says love must be sincere. He uses a word here, a Greek word called agape. So he says agape must be sincere, and agape is a type of love, and it's specifically a selfless love, that when I agape you, I am loving you. I'm thinking about your needs. I'm thinking about how I can serve you. I'm thinking about what's necessary in your life. I'm not thinking about me. It's a, it's a no strings attached kind of love. So Paul says, you, I want you to agape each other, but you agape must be sincere. This word sincere, when you take it back to its Greek roots, it's tied to the concept of where we get the idea of hypocrisy hypocrisy. So in the, in the Greek culture, a hypocrite, the word hypocrite comes out of the, the definition of, of being uh, artistic or theatrical. So every actor that you've ever watched is a hypocrite by definition. They are portraying a role that is untrue. They're putting a facade up. They're pretending to be someone other than they are. That's where that word has its roots. And so Paul kind of taps on that language. And what he's saying here is this, agape, selfless love, must not be hypocritical. There's no strings attached. Agape must be 
sincere. It must be true. I love you because I love you. And then we would poke back into Jesus' teaching and he's like, right, that's how I loved you. I really got nothing out of it. I love you with a pure love and I want you to love each other with a pure love, an agape love. I want you to love your neighbor with a pure love. I want you to even love your enemies with a pure love. That is how I want this to work. And I want you to do that with one another. So when we're doing that, the Bible would say that the offer of agape must be sincere but the reception of agape must also be sincere. I love you with no strings attached, and I receive that love, and I'm not trying to trick you or deceive you. And so we said this last week, and the offer uh, of the gift and the reception of the gift is to be sincere, and we liken it to the idea of playing catch, that when we're one anothering, according to what the Bible's teaching us, that we're going to be the giver and the receiver. When I play catch, in order to play that game, I am the thrower, and you receive it, and then to play the game, we have to switch. I become the receiver, and you throw the ball to me. And as we do that back and forth, we're playing catch. That's the way that God says, I want relationships to work. You are the giver of love, you're the receiver of love. You're, you're the person that gets to know a person, and you're the person that allows people to get to know you. It's back and forth with sincerity and selflessness, and I want people to look at my people, and they will know you are my disciples when you do that with one another. So we had a big, long conversation about that. It's really an, an important one, and it, it's online, it's on the podcast, it's on the app, all that stuff's always free at Grace, but it may be worth a listen for you because you can't talk about one anothering and you can't talk about relationships without that foundation, that there's a purity to it, there's a sincerity to it, there's a selflessness to it, right? And that's the idea that Jesus puts in place and once for his people. Now, this weekend, what I want to do is I want to take us a step deeper into all this. And, and I, want to, I want to show you how this starts to work. Because we said this last weekend. We said, even if we signed up for that, and we said, okay, I want to love as I've been loved by Christ. Sometimes that's easy, right? Sometimes it's really easy to love somebody. You just get along and easy peasy. Sometimes it's very difficult because there's baggage and there's wounds and there's scars and, and so sometimes it's very difficult. And most of the time it's confusing. So when we talk about, well, how do I actually do this? Where we're gonna go is we're, we're gonna get right into our relationships with each other and our relationships have nuances. And it's confusing how to do this. And this is where the one another's God gives us are so helpful. There's 59 different one another commands all throughout the scripture. And when I'm confused about how to love someone or not sure what to do, I can grab one of those one another's and I can apply it. And I'm going to show you today that those one another's are universal. So they work in all relational situations. And they become descriptors or tangible ways that we can express God's love to each other as he expresses it to us. And we can love then as we have been loved. So let me show you another place of this scripture. If you've got a Bible, open them up to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. It's page uh, eight, 982 in the Bibles under the chairs, or if you want to use your, uh, your app, it's all on the app there. If you're watching online, it'll be uh, tied to the, the live stream there. So 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll start with verse 7. Peter's going to kind of reissue this challenge. He's going to reinforce what Jesus said, then Paul said, now he's going to say it, right? Another one of the apostles. And then he's going to put some skin on it. He's going to give us a bit of a how-to with it. And I want to use this to kind of show us how we would interact with the one another. It's verse 7, chapter 4, 1 Peter, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Ready? Here it is. 
offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you receive to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The Apostle Peter comes in and he's reinforcing what Jesus said, and then he's teaching us how to put a little bit of skin on it. He's teaching us kind of how to play catch with each other. So he starts with this reinforcement, and he says this, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. So here it is again. Love each other as you have been loved, and he says a little bit differently, love each other deeply, and there's the confusion. Like, well, what does that mean? How do I love someone deeply? Because we're all individuals, and because we all have our own circumstances and life story, how do I love you deeply? That's, that's going to have nuances to it, and that's where it gets confusing. I might express love to someone deeply one way, but they receive that love a different way, or based on your circumstances or your story, your personality, that may all shift up for you. So uh, here's an example for this. If, if, uh, if you said, Pastor Jeff, uh, I love you, you're my friend, you're my pastor, I care a lot about you, I want to express love to you deeply. And I've been looking at you, and you look horrible. You just look horrible. You have deep circles under your eyes. You look stressed out. You look a little anemic. You're always kind of pale. You look exhausted. I just am worried to death about you. What you should do is you should take a vacation. You should go on vacation. You should, you should get away. You should take the weekend off. You should go on a sabbatical. You should probably retire before it's too late. Like you have to do, you've got to stop working so hard, you've got to stop it. If you wanted to express love to me deeply, that's the last thing you would ever want to say to me. If you started saying that to me, I would mostly want to punch you in the face. That's what I would want to do, right? Because I would not receive it. You might appreciate that. That may be a way that someone expresses love to you deeply, but that's not the way you would express, the love, uh, express love to me deeply. If you wanted to express love to me deeply, if you looked at me and said you look tired and worn out, pressuring me to get away would be the wrong thing. What you would want to do for me is you would want to come beside me, help me finish my work. And when my work is done and I don't have to think about it anymore, I'll be more than happy to go on vacation. See? Because I'm me, and you're you. And you look and say, well, I want to express love to my friend or my loved one deeply, but I'm going to receive it one way, and you may have another love language. I'll give you another example. Some of you ladies, some of you ladies might love flowers and jewelry and frilly stuff, right? And so if your husbands or your boyfriends wanted to express love to you, they might get you flowers or diamond earrings or frilly stuff like that. Now, if you wanted to express love to my wife Heidi, what she would love more than all those things is like power tools. <laughs> She's awesome. I could spend a fortune on fluffy stuff and flowers and she'd be like, I wanted a nail gun. That's what I wanted. And it's not my fault that my wife's cooler than your wife. She just is. And so that's just the way that is. But she, she's her own person, right? That's the point. She, she would think something's different. And if we blanketed people that way, we'd all be a little bit offended by that. See? So that's the confusion. If you put a blanket on me or a blanket on you and said, well, this is what love is, we wouldn't receive it that well, but then we've got this command to love each other deeply. So what do we do then? If I, if I want to do that, how do I do that when I'm dealing with individuals? Maybe family, spouse, good friends, roommate, maybe we know five, ten people deeply enough to, to know how to do that, but mostly we would not. How do we do this for a stranger, a neighbor, an enemy? What, what would you do with it? 
And this is where our creator God would look at us and say, hey, I can help. Because I created a humanity, because I created you to need relationships with each other, and because I wove you together in your mother's womb, one of the things I've done is I've given you some help with this. In fact, I've given you 59 different one another's And these one another's are universal expressions of love. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your personality type. It doesn't matter your history. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't doesn't matter your culture, your language, or what place in history you were born. These one another's are universal expressions of love. And I want my people to be known for their love for each other and for the world around them. And these become kind of tools that you can use to universally express love to other people over time, history, cultures, and all the rest, right? So it's fascinating what Peter does is he gives this big command in chapter 8, love each other deeply, love covers them all two sins. The very next thing he says, he says that in verse 8, the very next thing that he says in verse 9 is a one another. So it's almost as if Peter writes this letter to the early church, love each other deeply. I'm not sure how to do that. Peter's like, I gotcha. Here's a way that you can do this. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Everybody who needs hospitality will receive it. It doesn't matter the time, it doesn't matter the culture, it doesn't matter the place, it doesn't matter the place in history. It doesn't, you don't even have to speak the same language. If somebody is in need of hospitality and it's offered to them, they will receive that as an expression of love. And if you want to love them the way that Christ has loved you, you can use hospitality. Now let's talk about this for a second. <clears throat> this word hospitality... The Bible is going to use that word, especially here in this verse, differently than we're going to use it in North America. And it's not that we use it wrong, it's that we live in a different culture in a different place. So most of the time in North America, when we use the word hospitality, we're talking about some form of social entertainment. That's usually what we're talking about. Right? So usually we would say, if we want to offer hospitality, we'd say, hey, why don't you come over and watch the Super Bowl with me? Or, or why don't you come over and watch Ohio State with me? Right? And we'll get a pizza. Or what if we go out to dent- dinner? Or we'll host Thanksgiving in our house. It's usually some context like that that we talk about hospitality. In the Bible, especially here in 1 Peter chapter 4, when Peter uses that word, he means something different by it. Most of the time in the Bible, when God talks about hospitality, he's talking about people being in need, people that need to be sheltered, and it's some version of a life and death issue. So I'm in need, I'm I'm exposed, I need to be sheltered, and it's some version of a life and death issue. So let's go back to the ancient world and our thinking. And think about this kind of an example. I'm a traveler. I'm traveling from one city to the next. When I'm on that journey, there's not a a Hilton, a Marriott, you know, a, a Holiday Inn. And I'm traveling and I'm going to be in need of shelter. If I have a relative and I know that I have a relative and I know where they live, I'm probably going to stay with my relative. I can't call them. There's no email. I can't send a text, right? And so I'm going to show up at your house unannounced. I'm going to knock on the door. It's night. I haven't eaten. It's cold. Can you shelter me? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to need hospitality. Will you welcome me into your home and into your life in my moment of of need? It's fascinating in the Bible and Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews goes on, he says, you should be prepared, Christ followers, you should be prepared to offer hospitality even to strangers. Why would the Bible say that? Why is that such a big deal? Because I'm a traveler. 
when I'm traveling, there's no phone, there's no rest area, there's no gas station, right? I'm traveling. When I'm traveling, if I get delayed, if I get lost, if I'm hurt, right? If the donkey breaks down because it's a Chevy, I should have got a four. If the donkey breaks down, like if something happens to me, I'm going to have to go knock on a door. See? I, the, it's, a, it's a rainstorm in the middle of winter. It's a blizzard. I'm going to have to knock on the door. My life is in danger. I'm exposed. I, I was walking on a three-day journey in the ancient world, and I rolled my ankle and broke my ankle. That's a life and death situation in the ancient world. There's no 911 to call. And so the writer of Hebrews says, you would offer hospitality when someone is in need, when they're exposed, and they knock on the door and they interrupt your rhythm of life, you agape them. You love them and you do whatever is necessary to meet their need. Uh, the way that we would relate to this kind of in a modern world, uh, uh, a group that's good at this is the recovery community. So I'm, I'm recovering, I'm, I'm uh, fighting my alcohol addictions or opioids or drugs or whatever I'm doing, and I'm in the recovery community, and I have a sponsor. And I'm fighting the addictions, and I ask you to be my sponsor. And when, I'm, uh, when I agree to be a sponsor, I'm kind of agreeing to give hospitality. You call me when you're in trouble, when you're exposed. When you're about ready to relapse, you call me, and I will welcome that intrusion. I will give hospitality without grumbling, and I will agape you. I will meet your need wherever you need me to meet it. Uh, a historical representation of this mindset that we would be familiar with would be the Underground Railroad. When, when slavery is going on, and there's people trapped in injustice in this immoral system, and they need to be escaping to freedom, the Underground Railroad would smuggle them and move them, and they would do that in and out of people's home. And the, the one who wanted to have justice for them would offer hospitality. They, they would give food, they would give shelter, they would give care at their own cost, it was agape, it was selfless, right? When you read the New Testament and you see the early church, you see this happen all the time. Paul or Peter or whoever, one of the apostles, would be speaking in a synagogue. Everybody would get mad. The Jewish leaders would get fired up. Sometimes the Roman government would get fired up. The Christ followers would go, they would grab them, they would protect the, the teacher who's proclaiming the gospel and refuses to recant that Christ rose again from the dead, so they would protect them, and they would take them to someone's home, and they would be sheltered in that home, and then they would escape. They would escape that persecution, see? Even today, in our current world, where the church is persecuted, so China, Iran, Iraq, the Middle East, places like that, Believers gather in each other's homes. They don't have big public gatherings like this. They would gather in the home. And the home that is hosting it is loving that group of people. They're putting themselves in peril. They're agapeing that. So when Peter says, love each other deeply, what would be a universal expression of deep love for each other? He's like, here's one for you offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Like that would be an expression. And when you're exposed, when you're hurt, when you're scared, when you're unsafe, and you knock on the door and someone welcomes you, that is always received as a universal expression of love. Why? Because it reflects the heart of God. God is a welcoming God. He is a hospitable God. Psalms 23, for in the day of trouble, God will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred 
tent. Psalms 55, I will hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and far from the storm. God loves us whenever we are in trouble, whenever we're hurt, whenever we're exposed, we run to God. In fact, we're most apt to run to God when we're in those situations. And every time we knock on God's proverbial door, he opens the door and he's glad that we're there. He's a hospitable God. He says, I want my people to be known for their love. How could I express love? Well, the way that you can express love that is universal is be hospitable. You want to stick out like a sore thumb or cut against the grain of our culture. We live in a culture where we are terrified of each other. We have bars on the windows, we deadbolt the door, we have security systems, we turn our doorbell into a camera so we can catch people. We're terrified of each other. And so what happens as a culture, if I'm in trouble, I don't go to anybody's home. They scare me. You take hospitality and you push that against that cultural backdrop and all of a sudden you stick out differently. You're known in a different way. Hospitality is desperately needed in our culture because we live in a culture where we are exposed, where we're unsafe, where we're unsure and where we need help from each other. New survey out, it's about three months old, of millennials Millennials are the most connected generation in the history of planet Earth because of the smartphone. They surveyed millennials who talked to people all day and all night. 64% of them said, I'm lonely. I'm lonely. Why? Because people know information about me, but they don't know me. They like me, but they don't love me. I'm lonely. I'm exposed. I'm not sure what to do. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Newest surveys out, about 17 million adults are are estimated to be depressed. About 20% of teenagers would say, I'm depressed. I read an article about three years ago, and the, the counselor in this article made this argument He says depression is often tied. There is certainly like a chemical imbalance where people are clinically or chemically depressed. But he said much of what we would say, I'm depressed or I'm anxious, comes from isolation. I'm isolated, I'm unsure, and all of my support networks are unsafe. 50% divorce rate, 43% of kids don't live with their father in the home. So all those normal systems are disrupted. The, our, the counselor made this argument, he said, it's my contention that if people could come into a community that was stable, that was safe and trusted or what Paul might call sincere, that was others oriented and that was easily accessible, most symptoms of depression and anxiety would be relieved. That sounds exactly like a life group to me or exactly like a church or a student life group. That sounds like hospitality. I know where I can find trusted, loving people and I can get to them. And in a world that knows information but doesn't know each other, it sits, see, as a stark contrast against it. A single parent who's not sure what to do. New parents who are just overwhelmed. Married people who are struggling. Single people who are lonely. Elderly people who are not connected. How do we love them? It's so confusing. The world is so complicated. Peter would say, love them deeply. How? Well, you could offer hospitality. Everyone receives that as an offer of love when they need it. Generational gaps. 
you're an older generation, you're, you're, maybe your nest is empty, and you're saying, how do I reach out to these young people? Those millennials, they're so weird. They're so wacky, always doing their tickety tockety on their telephones. And what do I do with those millennials? If you're an empty nester, you want to know how to reach a, a, a millennial, a college student, you have an incredible asset that they'll be incredibly open to. You know what it is? It's your house. Invite them over for dinner. College students will do anything if you feed them. See? Let them use your washer and dryer. Tell them your story, not your politics, not your agenda, your story. Offer hospitality. And you might be shocked. You might be shocked how those relational bridges open up. When we express Christ's love through our love for each other by simply being hospitable in a world that creates need and isolation and vulnerability. Jesus would look and say, in essence, you can know they're my disciples because when you knock on the door... They'll open it and be glad you're there. Yeah, that works. One of, the, one of the greatest expressions of hospitality that I ever had in my life was about 20 years ago in, in Argentina. Heidi and I had a, a group of students that we took down to Argentina to help a church planner down there for a couple of weeks. And so we flew down to Argentina. I do not speak any languages. In fact, I have a little bit of a learning disability. I have a, I can't catch other languages and I can't catch things that are unfamiliar to me. That's why for some of you, I, I, I always am grateful that you tell me your name again. Cause if it's Steve or Betty or Sue, I can get it. But if it's an unfamiliar sound, it doesn't register in my brain. And so not only don't I catch it, I can't read it. So when I go to like a, a different country that's doing a different language, that word on that street sign looks like lines and noises to me. It doesn't look like anything intelligible, right? So I always just have Heidi with me because she's brilliant and speaks three languages. So that's easy peasy. And so we went down to Argentina and we're helping out with this and we had kids with us. And this was before uh, cell phones and the internet. It was right after electricity and the wheel, but before cell phones and internet. And so because we had a bunch of teenagers with us, they needed to call home every few days, just let their parents know that they're fine. So back then what you would do is you would go to a pay phone with your MCI calling card and you would punch in a bunch of numbers and you would call up and you could talk to everybody. And so I took the kids down the road to the pay phone for them to check in. And then we were gonna break into teams of three or four and go like canvas this neighborhood, and invite people to a Bible camp. And this is in Buenos Aires, Argentina, which is a city of over 20 million people. So we're in this mammoth place doing this. And so we're at the, we're at the payphone, and we call home, and a couple kids talk to their parents, and then they would go off on their teams, and another couple kids would do it, and then they go off on their teams. And it wound up that everybody left, but I got kind of hung up on the phone for a while talking to somebody about something. And by the time I was done on the phone, I looked up and all the teams were gone. And so I thought, well, I'm a reasonably intelligent adult. I can, I'll just go find them. So I started walking down the neighborhood and I thought, well, they must be like over there. And I went over there, they weren't there. And I was like, oh, they probably just hung a right. And so I hung a right, I went over there and they weren't there. And I was like, oh, they probably just went over that way. And I went that way. And they weren't there. And this started about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. By about 7 o'clock that night, I thought, I'm probably lost. Right? I was lost. And I had no idea how to get where I was going. I didn't know where I was staying. I didn't know the name of the street. I didn't know we were staying at a church. I didn't know the name of the church. I couldn't remember the name of the pastor because that stuff doesn't stick in my brain in, in, in any kind of a reasonable way. And so I am super duper lost. It's starting to get dark. I'm starting to notice that people are noticing me because I don't blend in well other places. And so I'm like 
I'm probably going to get in trouble here and I, I need to get out of the neighborhoods that I, am, I was in because I didn't have street lights. And I thought, well, if I could at least find like something lit up, I would probably be safer there. So I wandered up to like this business district that had lighting and, and I kind of wandered onto the street and I saw a store that was open, this furniture store that was open. So I went into this furniture store and this really sweet lady came out and said something to me in Spanish. I don't know what it was, probably something like, hello, and we're having a special on couches, you know, kind of thing. She thought I was a customer. I can't speak Spanish. I don't understand Spanish. I'm no good with languages. And so I just started speaking English. And I was like, I'm lost. I'm lost. And she just looked at me, and I'm like, I'm El Losto. Like, I'm like, I'm really, really lost. Like, I need help, you know, kind of thing. And she was, she was like, what do you mean? And so I started trying to think of ways to describe my situation. And so I was like, I'm an American. Like, she couldn't guess that. I'm like, I'm an American. I, I flew down from the United States and I'm here with a church, a church, Jesus Christo. I'm with a church, and she's just looking at me, and bless her, she's trying so hard to help me. I'm useless. I just kept repeating myself, like, help, el helpo. You know, I, I, I'm like all stuck with it. She finally gets like a coworker from the back. He comes out, he's trying to help me. I'm like, I can't. And so they're probably saying, like, well, where are you staying? Do you know an address? I can't understand any of it, and I couldn't repeat it even if I did. And so I just kept saying, Jesus Christo, I'm an American that flew, that flew down. And so these dear folks, they got out this map, and it was probably, they probably used it to like deliver furniture with, and they got out this map, and they're, they're like, can you point to us on the map where you're from? And I'm like, no, I can't. I don't know the name of the street. I don't know the name of the church. I don't remember any of that. And so they go over and they start conversing with each other. This is a solid 45 minute interaction that's going on here. And they start looking. And so they kind of like circle something and they look at me and they're like, what about that? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what it is. And so she gets on the phone and she calls a cab and the cab comes to the store, and she's like, get in the cab. And I'm like, I don't have any money. I, don't, I, I can't pay for the cab. So she goes and gets her purse. She gets money out. She pays the cab driver and tells me to get in. So I did. So I got, on to, I got into the cab. So about 45 minutes later, the cab pulls up in front of the church, and I'm like, that's it. Like, that's, that's the building I'm staying in. I got out of the cab. Heidi came out. I think she was glad to see me, but I also thought she might hit me, you know, kind of thing. And she came out. She's like, we were all terrified. I'm like, you were terrified. You speak Spanish. Like, I was terrified, right? It was incredible. Now, Here's the thing, I, I, like, I like to imagine her going home that night to her husband. She's like, you're not going to believe what happened at the store today. Like, an American came in, <laughs> thought he was Jesus Christ, like flew down here, you know, kind of thing. That lady, see, that lady practiced hospitality. I don't know, I can remember her face, I can remember faces, I can't remember names. I remember her face. Somebody asked me last night, they said, did you ever go pay her back? I'm like, no, I had no idea where I was. I couldn't find her again if my life depended on it, right? I couldn't remember her face. I, I can remember her face. I don't know her name. I don't know anything about her. I assume by her love, she's a Christ follower. The, the only thing I have to gauge was her hospitality. And her welcoming me in communicated love to me. It's universal. Different country, different continent, different ages. We couldn't even communicate. But she did a one another. And I knew it was loving. I knew I could trust her because of the love that she was expressing to me, okay? 
Now, I want you to catch something. I had to play catch with that lady. I had to play catch. So one side of the coin is that she was hospitable to me. The other side of that coin is, ready? I knocked on the door. Hospitality works a couple ways. Hospitality is to be offered, but it must be received. We got to play catch to do a one another. She took all the time. She agaped me. Everything was about what I needed. But I received it. I walked around like a fool for 10 hours. And when I got desperate enough, I knocked on the door. When she said, get in the cab, I got in the cab. I had to receive what she was offering in order for it to be a one another relationship. So half of this conversation is a challenge that would say we need to be hospitable people. The other half of it is some of us are wandering around. We're self-isolating. And it, it could be pain, it could be pride, it, it could be a thousand things that are unique to you and we couldn't even begin to guess it. But the one anothering is not just us being heroic, it's also us being humble. And for God's people, if you're not a Christ follower yet, there's a, there's a little bit of a pass in what I'm about ready to say. If you're a Christ follower, there's no pass. For God's people, the one anothering is not a suggestion, it's a command. All of them are. So for God's people to self-isolate is actually not an option. Well, Jeff, I just... I mean, where do you get involved? How do you meet people? I just don't know. I've been coming to the church for three years and I don't have any friends. And I would, I would have to look at you and say, I, I'll talk about your pain, I'll talk about your nuances, but come on. How many times have you been invited to life groups? How many times have we talked about the youth ministry or the college ministry or the kids ministry? How many times have I looked at people watching online by themselves and said, you need to come in? The doors are wide open. But you have to decide not to wander around. See, it's, it's a double, it's, we're playing catch. And, and sometimes you're the thrower and sometimes you're the receiver and everybody in the game of catch is both. That works. Why well, I, I just feel all alone. How, how many times have your friends invited you? Well, they're married now. I'm saying, come on, that's not fair. That doesn't mean they're not your friends. That's not fair. How many times has your grandma said, I miss you? See, for some of us, we won't receive the invitations. And in hospitality, you knock on the door, it's opened, and I'm glad to see you. That's one side of the responsibility. But if you're out there on the street, if I'm in the door, I can't go grab you and drag you in. That's called kidnapping. It's a felony. Right? That's not how it works. You have to be willing to knock sincerely. And then sincerely, we agape each other. When you knock... Someone sincerely welcomes you. I want a cup of coffee. I'd love to get together. I'm feeling, I'm feeling my, my last life group blew up. You're welcome to come to ours. The circus, since I've had the baby, I'm home at the house by myself all the time. Here's all of these mothering groups. You're, we would love, there's a, thousand women at grace like that. You see what I'm saying? And it's on and on and on and on. But it's a willingness to open the door and it's a willingness to walk through it 
And when God's people especially love each other that way, that's how they're known as God's people. When our world, when people who are not yet followers of Christ, when they sense that invitation, you don't have to preach a sermon, you don't have to quote a verse, you don't have to drag them to church. You can express the heart, the mind, the love of God through you for your love for them by being hospitable. See how that works? So that's the way the one another's play out. And we're, we're not going to go through all 59. I, I want you to get your head around how this works. And this is another example. Last week we talked about forgiveness. This week we're talking about hospitality. And that's how that works. And, and it's universal. And if it's needed, it's received. And it's always received as an expression of love. Okay. All right. Band's going to give us a, a few minutes to think and pray and process. And here's some questions I wrote down that if you need them, you can chew on them. On one side of the coin, I asked this question. I actually asked it of myself, but I, I asked myself, am I a shelter? Am I a shelter or am I a wall? As a Christ follower, when you look at my life, do you see someone who will love you and help you? That does not mean that I have to agree with you or affirm you or participate with you. That has nothing to do with me welcoming you into my life. I love, I, do I love you? Do they see that or do they see my agenda, my politic, my soapbox, my whatever, my busyness? Do they see my... Do they see the door to knock on or the wall to not cross over? Am I a shelter? And then flip the coin. And I have to ask the question, am I a wanderer? Am I a wanderer? There are relationships to be had. But we, you can't be kidnapped. It doesn't work that way. There's help to be had, but I got to knock on the door. And even if I do it in a, in a totally dysfunctional way, I'm lost to, right? The expression will be received and people who are hospitable will help figure that out in the nuances of your individuality. Okay. So am I a shelter? Am I a wanderer? Both of those things need to be addressed for me to be one who loves in the manner that I'm loved by Christ. Okay. All right, would you pray with me as the band settles in? Jesus, help us with this, me especially, all of us. God, it's, it's pain, it's busyness, it's all of it that causes us not to be a shelter. And God, would you change us as individuals and even make this, I want this to be true of our church, God. You can be a sinner and you can be in trouble and we can disagree vehemently and yet love each other. And so God, I want us to be a place of safety. I want to be one for my children and for my wife and for everyone that's around me. So help me to reflect that in my own life. And then God, for the wanderer, I can do that too. And my insecurity and my pride, I can isolate. And so God, help me to see that I need, I need to receive love as well as give it. So Holy Spirit, in these moments, as you press into the nuances of our lives, would you shape us and mold us and draw us to the place that you'd have us to be? Thank you, Jesus, for all of it in your name.